Turn with me to Deuteronomy. We'll be in chapter 1 again. I heard somebody very recently, if you don't know this about me, I love reading and listening to people who are totally wrong. It's, one, it's my favorite hobby. I heard somebody recently suggest that Protestants don't worship God at church because they've taken the pulpit, or in our case, a music stand, and put it in the middle and made it all about the preacher. Well, oh, that's interesting. He has half a point. This is a time that you can be here and you can be not worshiping. You can be here and you can just be hearing me talk. I'm here to direct you to God's words. And God's words are living and active. They have the power to convict us. They have the power to transform us, to bring us to life. It's when Jesus speaks that the dead come to life. You can be here hearing the words of God from the scripture and not be worshiping. The sacrifices of God, what he accepts, is a broken spirit and a broken contrite heart. The psalmist says, oh God, you will not despise. So I ask that you'd pray with me as we begin, that we would be offering ourselves here to God as a sacrifice and worshiping him. Lord God, I thank you for your word, that you have told us what pleases you. You have told us what you want from us. You have made the way clear. You have said that Jesus is the way. And I ask that we would present ourselves, each one of us, before you today that we would be willing to do your will, that we would be willing to put aside whatever in ourselves is wrong and submit ourselves to you and what you say. In Jesus' name, amen. I apologize, I'm sick, so if I sound bored, I'm not. I'm just sick. Or if I sound grumpy, I'm not. I hope I'm joyful. I pray that I'm more joyful all the time. I love the word. It brings me joy when I'm reading it, and I hope it comes across as we go through it. Deuteronomy 1, 2, and 3 are essentially a prologue to Deuteronomy. In these chapters, Moses is giving a historical overview to the people. I want to cover some of the surface level things about these chapters that you will hopefully know or you'll become aware of if you take the time to read it. Moses is, the book of Deuteronomy is a speech that Moses gives. It's all, it happens on one day. You know, Leviticus happens in a whole month. Exodus covers a year except for the 430 years that they cover at one point. Most of it is in one year. Genesis, 2,800 years, maybe 3,600 depending on which manuscript you're reading. Well, Deuteronomy is mostly just one day. One day, at the end of Moses' life, he knows he's going to die. God has told him. And you also, Moses says, and with me also, God was angry on account of you. And he said to me, you shall not enter in to the promised land, but you'll go to, the, much like Jesus, before he leaves, he turns, he goes east, he goes off the mountain, and they never see him again, and he gives some parting instructions, therefore go, make disciples. Well, so Moses the end of his life, he knows it's here. He's about to go east and go up a mountain and they're never going to see him again. And he's giving some parting instructions to the people. And the way that it puts it is, he undertook, this is chapter 1, verse 5, in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law. But he starts it out rather interestingly. You might think, if you're going to explain the law, well, where would you start? Well, maybe with the first law. That would be Exodus 12, Passover. Uh, maybe you'd start with creation. Moses starts with this. You, the Lord our God, said to us in Horeb, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites. It's interesting he starts there. He's not starting with the giving of the law. He's not starting with coming up out of Egypt. He's starting with after they have the law, after Leviticus, once they've been given all of the laws, he's already told them everything that they're going to do. He says, you've been at Sinai, Sinai is another word for Horeb, long enough. Go take the land that I've promised you. It's an interesting way to start explaining the law. Why is that fundamental? Well, look at chapter 2. 
Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea, as the Lord told me. And for many days we traveled around Mount Seir. Then the Lord said to me, You have been traveling around this mountain country long enough. Turn northward and command the people. Do you see how that's the same sort of thing? Here he says, you've been traveling around this mountain long enough. You've been staying at this mountain long enough. Turn and take your journey. Here he says, you've been traveling around this mountain country long enough. Turn northward. What has happened in between these two events is that Israel has rebelled. Forty years take place between the first command and the second. The first time God tells them, you've stayed here long enough. Turn, take your journey. Look at verse 8 of chapter 1. See, I've set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them and to their offspring after them. But they don't listen. God tells them to take the land, and Moses goes over this in chapter 1. But they sent out spies, and when the spies brought back the report, and the spies said, the people are greater and taller than us, the cities are fortified up to heaven. And besides, we've seen the sons of the Anakim there, which are basically giants. The people says, our, heart, our brothers have made our heart melt. And they were not willing to go up, but they rebelled against the word of the Lord. And God was angry with them for 40 years. And at the end of the 40 years, when all those guys had died, who had uh, refused, all the men of war had perished, then God says again, almost the same words. It's like, all right, take two. You've been at this mountain long enough. Turn. We're going to try this again. Moses is speaking to the people when they've received the command, but they received the command before, and last time they messed it up. And his instruction is don't mess it up again. So he's explaining the law, but the heart of the law is obedience to God. When he wants to explain the law, he starts with showing them who they are. They're rebellious. You messed it up. So he covers why they messed it up. And he wants them to be careful. Because they're about to have a second chance. Here's why they messed it up. Basically, two, three reasons. One, Moses says, in spite of this word, you did not believe. This word referring to, he said, don't be afraid of them. The Lord, your God, who goes before you, he himself will fight for you. Just as you saw him do for you in all the land of Egypt. And in this wilderness, you saw how he carried you as a man carries his son. Yet in spite of this word, you did not believe. In spite of all the good that God had done them, they didn't trust him. Instead, they said, it is because the Lord has hated us that he's brought us up out of Egypt to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. So the first reason, they didn't believe. Second reason, they rebelled. It's basically the same thing. They rebelled, they didn't believe. But another way he puts it, you rebelled against the command of the Lord. And a third reason, less explicit, is they're evil. When God swears they won't enter, he says, and the Lord swore, not one of the evil men, or the men of this evil generation, shall see the good land that I swore to your fathers. Good and evil often are go together. They're contrasting. The, the evil generation will not get to see the good land. But your children, your little ones, who you said would become a prey, your children who today have no knowledge of good or evil, they shall see it. To them I'll give it as a possession. They can't go because they're evil. The psalmist in Psalm 95, when he looks back on this event, he has God describe it like this. They always go astray in their heart. It's not just what they did. It's who they are. They're an evil generation. That They don't, they don't believe and they rebel. And so God's angry with them. And now Moses is coming to a second generation. And he's just warning them. Be very, very careful. 
this will be the theme throughout the whole book. Be careful. Remember what happened. Remember how you messed it up and don't mess it up again. Moses writes it in such a way that he is not just writing. I mean, he's speaking, but it's written in such a way it's not just for the people who are hearing him. It's very clearly intended for all generations to come. Look at chapter 1 and look at verse... Um, uh, where is it? If I can remember what I was looking for. I'll quote it while I'm looking for it. Maybe you'll find it. He said to them, Every one of you fastened on his weapons of war and thought it easy to go up into the hill country. That line, every one of you, Ask yourself, he's talking to the people in Moab. They're about to go in. And he says, every one of you fastened on his weapons of war and thought it easy to go up. How many of them did it? He says, every one of you. How many of them? You, your first thought might be, every one of them. Your second thought, if you're a scholastic type, you might think, Surely only the men over the age of 20. Well, that shot should lead you to another one. None of them. Not a single one of them. Because you read in chapter 2, 14, that the time from our leaving Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook Zered was 38 years until the entire generation, that is, the men of war, had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from the camp until they had perished. There's one exception, obviously, a Moses. Moses was 80 years old when he said to all the men of war, anyone over the age of 20, you will not enter. You will all die in 40 years. 40 years later, Moses is 120, and he's ready to go. If God would just let him, he'd take up his sword and go. But he said, Moses is telling them, every one of you fastened on his weapons of war, but actually not a single one of them did. He's saying you, but he's talking about their fathers. And so this is meant to be for not only them, but for every generation. God is addressing them and saying, this is what you did. This is the kind of people you are, Israel. And Moses will develop this throughout the book. He says, I know that you are a people of uncircumcised heart. In Exodus, he puts it this way. I've seen this people. They are a stiff-necked people. And every generation is addressed with this because every generation has to look back and go, where did we go wrong? And if they go wrong again, they won't get to enter the land. But Moses knows it's, it doesn't stop there. This is not a once-off test. God is looking for a good people, a good generation. He wants to create a great nation as he promised to Abraham. A great nation is not full of evil people that don't listen to God and don't believe and rebel. It's full of people who love God and fulfill the law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. This people don't. That's their problem. And every generation has to deal with it anew. So Moses knows, as he goes on in the book, he tells them, when you get into the land, you will disobey. And God will bring on you curses. You have to obey, if you, not just to get into the land, but to get the rest of the land and to receive blessings in the land. You could be in the land and terrified of all the other nations around you. Or you could, as God says, if you obey, I'll make you the head and not the tail. You will go only up and never go down. You will lend out and never borrow. They have to obey, not like their fathers. He, for them... The fact that they will disobey in the future and be kicked out of the land is as certain as the fact that they, God swore to these people they wouldn't enter. Because when Moses is saying this, he's speaking for God, and God tells them, as a matter of fact, past tense, even though it hasn't happened yet, in chapter 32, Jeshurun, meaning upright one, but is referring to Israel, because they were upright, Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, stout, and sleek. You forsook the God who made you. 
You forgot the rock of your salvation. You scoffed at him. He knows they will sin. Why? The same reason their fathers. They haven't changed. He's addressing every generation. This was your problem, Israel. You don't believe. You're rebellious. And you're evil. Notice, before we move on a bit from here, in chapter 1, verses 9 through 18, he introduces that he appointed leaders for them. It's interesting he ties this in. He tells them in verse 17, you shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone, for the judgment is God's. It's the same language he uses to tell them, don't be afraid, don't be intimidated, don't be dismayed of the people that God's sending you to fight. The same faith that will bring you into the promised land is the faith, faith that you need to judge righteously when you're in the land, to have a um, working government, if you will. And so the same rebellion that brought God's wrath on them for 40 years, that had him reject that entire generation and say, this is a crooked, twisted generation, children in whom is no faithfulness. The same unbelief that brought about that wrath of God is the wrath, or is the unbelief that you see when they judge wrongly. Such that when the Sanhedrin, when the Pharisees condemn Jesus to death, they are demonstrating that they are exactly like their fathers who did not believe, who rebelled against the command of the Lord, and were evil. It says they brought false witnesses against him. Remember Nicodemus says, does our law judge someone without hearing him first? And they said, oh, you follow him too. They just hated him. Even Pilate could see. They were just envious of him. And by killing him, even though he was innocent, and they had no crime with which to charge him, by showing partiality, by not hearing it, by not letting the judgment be God's, they showed that they are exactly like this first generation. And notice, they did it because they were afraid. They were afraid of the Romans. They said, we have no king but Caesar. Why? Because they love Caesar? No, because they're afraid of the Romans. They're afraid that Jesus riding in on a donkey would declare war and get them all killed. So it's better for one man to die than the whole nation should perish. Meaning, let's kill this guy before he gets us all killed. They were afraid. Jesus told them that Jerusalem would be destroyed. He said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that its destruction is near. And he told the Christians, get out of there. And the Christians did. But nobody else listened to Jesus. To use the language Moses uses of this first generation, every one of you fastened on his weapons of war and thought it easy to fight. They were so terrified, these Israelites, because the giants, oh, there's giants, how are we ever going to survive? God's not with us. And then God said, all right, you're not the people. You're not going in. I reject you. And then they get their swords. Oh, it'll be easy. They were so terrified of the Romans until Jesus told them, you're going to lose. Then suddenly, they all thought it would be easy to fight the Romans, and they died like Jesus told them they would. Now, I wish I could tell you, I, I, I say I wish, there's a part of me that wishes I could tell you that the application of this passage in our day is um, just, oh, you know, that's how it was in the Old Testament. Back then, they had to be careful. Um, Back then they were told, you will disobey. I wish I could tell you it's totally different now, but actually we are told. There's a difference. Israel is told that Israel, as a nation, will fall away. They will disobey. They'll be kicked out of the land. God will be angry with them. No, we're not told that the church will fall away. But we are told this, the love of many will grow cold. Paul says in Timothy 4, the Spirit expressly says in the latter days, some will leave. They'll follow the teaching of demons. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians that a great apostasy is coming, a rebellion. 
We're not told that the church will fall away, but we are told that many will. And our nature, just like Israel's nature, nobody naturally does what is pleasing to God. It has to be supernatural. You have to have a circumcised heart, and only God can make it happen. I don't have to think very hard about how this passage gets applied, because this is the very story that Paul is talking about when he says, these things happened for, as examples for us. They were written down for our instruction. David understood that this, this story was meant to instruct them. Uh, we won't turn to Psalm 95 where he talks about it. We'll turn to Hebrews 3. In Hebrews 3, the New Testament is taking this story and it's understanding it through the Psalms that talk about it. It's understanding it through the history of all that's happened since and just applying it directly to the church. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, when your, your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years, referring to this event. There was a day of testing. They failed. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation. I said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And then he just applies it directly to us. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who are those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? Paul makes that same point. He's pointing out, look, these guys that rebelled, they saw the Red Sea open. They saw the works. They heard the word of God from a pillar of fire on Mount Sinai. Command them, you shall have no other gods before me. And just about a month later, after, and the fire is still there, I might add. They can see the fire, and they make a golden calf and worship it. Well, the fire is still right there. They had received salvation. They had received God's favor. God had revealed himself to them. He'd been in their midst. He'd led them. He'd carried them like a father. He'd shown them so much goodness, and they rebelled. The author of Hebrews is pointing out they received greatly, and that did not exempt them from failure. I don't know what your experience is. When I read the Bible, sometimes I'm just overwhelmed by how glorious God is as I start to see just how true his word is, how it's all connected, how it all points to Christ. And so much of it is just right there. And I, I have to stop and worship I don't know if you have that experience, but even if you do, for me, that does not mean that now I'm a good Christian. If you see the glory of God, it's good. You should see the glory of God. But if you see the glory of God and then you go and sin, well, what good was seeing the glory of God? Actually, your judgment will be harsher. <coughs> Sorry. I wish I could say, you know, now that we have Jesus, we don't have to worry about anything. But actually, the point here being made is take care. The coming of Jesus does not mean that there's no longer any chance of failure. Actually, if anything, it amplifies the consequences. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. He says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? 
He says the same thing in chapter 10. If every disobedience towards Moses, if everyone who set aside the word of Moses was put to death on the evidence of two or three witnesses, how much worse will the punishment be for the one who tramples underfoot the Son of God and profanes the blood of his covenant? I'm going to conclude with this. Moses knew that in, there's two times in which the people of God are tempted by sin to fall away. One is in difficult times. When God says, fight giants. When God gives you an impossible task. Or when you're surrounded by people who hate you. Christians are promised in this life you will have trouble. And in the midst of trouble, you have to be very careful not to be afraid, but to be strengthened in your faith. Jesus says it this way. When you see, this is Luke 21, when you see this, these signs in heaven, the end times coming, and all the nations are terrified because of the wrath of the God coming on them, lift up your heads, for your salvation is near. Pray to God for strength to stand when the Son of Man comes. Moses knows, and the New Testament just reaffirms this, in your life, in the midst of difficulty, when sin crouches at the door, you're going to be tempted by the deceitfulness of sin. And so Moses warns them, don't fall away like they did. And they're a testimony to us that God can be wrathful towards a people, even if he's done much good to them. There's a second time, and Moses knows you will be tempted by the deceitfulness of sin in good times, in peaceful times. Jeshurun grew fat. Why? Because God blessed him so much. They had peace in the land. And Moses knew, you're going to have peace, and you're going to forget who gave it to you. Now, I don't know which one of those is you in your life. Maybe you've got a time of peace. Maybe you've got a time of difficulty. But I'm fairly certain that you're in one of those camps. And both of those camps need to hear the message. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that leads you to fall away from the living God. Those are all the evil, unbelieving heart falling away. Those are the problems we see in Deuteronomy. They were evil, evil generation. They were unbelieving. In spite of this word, you did not believe. And they, they go astray in their heart. They rebel. If we're not careful, we are by nature children of wrath, Paul says. Our default is to fall away. Our default is to go away like sheep. As I read this passage, I am made increasingly aware of my need for God. Just like this people, we have, uh, we have our lives before us. We have the things God's given us to do. And we need to be told, even if you're Moses, I mean, Moses had, he saw God face to face. Moses was exalted above all of them. He's so exalted, he almost doesn't even make sense in the Torah. Only the high priest can come into God. I mean, except Moses. Say, Moses just does what he wants. <laughs> Moses is great. And even Moses, God's angry with him. and says, you can't enter the land. We can't look back on things we've done. We can't look back on things God's done for us and say, I know I'll definitely inherit everything. We need to be told to be careful because God is a terrifying God who is angry with them and will be angry with those who reject Jesus. Not a popular message today, I'm sure, but I know it's one that I need to hear. I am just so prone to sin. So I'm going to ask that you pray with me We'll just pray through um, some, some of the words of David as he took his sin to God. Lord God, I know that if we say we have no sin, we make you a liar. So we, we want to confess before you. Admit, we are sinners. We need your grace. Unless you go with us, surely we'll fall. So go with us, Lord. Be in our presence. Have mercy on us according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. We know our sin. We know our iniquity. It's always before us. Against you only we've sinned. 
We've done what's evil in your sight. Lord, create in us clean hearts. Renew in us right spirits. Cast us not away from your presence, but uphold us with a willing spirit. Restore to us the joy of our salvation. Let us hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have broken in us, if you have brought us to a point of grief over our sin, then let those bones rejoice. Lord, convict us of our sin. Give us a grief that leads to repentance and a repentance that leads to joy. And give us endurance that we would run with endurance the race set before us to the end and inherit with all the faithful the wonderful blessings that you have promised to those who obey you. Lord, let us be among that number. In Jesus' name, amen.